surreal pleasure and honor to be here with you all. And um, I would be, before I start talking about the subject at hand, I'd be remiss um, without thanking the organizers. Um, there's a number of organizations who've been part of this, which is great, particularly um, uh, the Students for Democratic Society here at U of R, and then um, especially the, the Christian Witness for Peace who I understand for, for Palestine, excuse me, even better, um, who, who I understand has, has really done extraordinary work um, building solidarity for Palestine here in Rochester and put a lot of work into this event. And um, I would also be remiss if I, if I didn't say that um, there are people in this room who really taught me um, and, and nurtured me during formative time in my life when I was here in Rochester at another university that won't be named. Um, <laughs> a worse university. Uh, and um, and uh, people who, who taught me how to think and how to write and, um, and listen to my first speeches, which were not always the best. So um, I'm very grateful for, for this place and for Rochester's activist community. With that, um, I want to talk about something that happened just several weeks ago in September in St. Louis, uh, which St. Louis just may be um, my generation's Birmingham in terms of what it represents. Uh, this whole country has, um, of course, been a nightmare for black people for a few centuries. <laughs> But St. Louis at the moment is really, um, well, been leading the way in terms of violence against black people, but the resistance there has also been very important. Well, um, several weeks ago, there was a protest in response to yet another um, acquittal of a police officer who murdered a black person. The name of the black person was Anthony Lamar Smith. He was killed in 2011. And the officer who killed him got off for it, even though there was actually video evidence um, in, taken from the officer's patrol car when he was trailing Anthony. And in the video, he says, I'm going to kill this person. Don't you know it? He didn't use the word person. If you want to, you can look up what he actually said. I won't say it here. Um, but then he went ahead and did what he said. And yet he, um, he was acquitted of the crime. And so there were several days and nights of protest. Um, and on one of those nights, I should say each, each protest that happened was really quite brutally repressed by the St. Louis Police Department and other police departments that were mobilized to put down the, the protests. Um, on one of those, after one of those protests, the police actually chased activists into a synagogue where they sought refuge. The synagogue opened their doors to protesters. And they sought refuge there, and the police surrounded the synagogue. And um, not only arrested people coming out, not only fired tear gas on the outside, but also used this new weapon that they had, which is a truck that sprays this putrid liquid. Um, it's a liquid that uh, is meant to smell like decaying flesh. And if it gets onto your skin, it's very, it's impossible to, to kind of wash off with, um, it, it takes several washes with soap and water to get it off. It can stay with you for days. <clears throat> so this, this truck, this new weapon, um, it's called the skunk truck. And it actually was made in Israel and it was purchased by the St. Louis Police Department um, just a couple of years ago. So the people in St. Louis who experienced this new weapon may not have known that they were sharing an experience that they were having experience that was connected with and bound with people who are protesting on the streets of Janine and the streets of Ramallah in uh, Palestine. Whether they knew that or not, it's true. It's a fact. Um, and 
It is the case that the St. Louis Police Department actually has extensive collaboration with the Israeli state, with Israeli police forces. Um, high level, high ranking officers in that department have been to Israel for trainings, um, along with other cities in the United States. And the list is long, but I'll just say um, the NYPD not only has um, extensive trainings and collaboration with Israeli police forces, but actually has an office in Tel Aviv. Um, the Boston Police Department, Boston and Cambridge, the two major cities where I live, um, the Chicago Police Department, the Oakland Police Department, etc. Now, why? Why is it that these police departments have relationships, extensive collaborative relationships, with security forces in other countries? This is because Israel actually markets itself as specializing in questions of security, um, specializing in things like fighting terrorism and so on. That's how they describe it. What I would say, and what I think many others would say, more specifically is that Israel, the Israeli state, its day-to-day -day kind of existence is really premised on the subjugation of the Palestinian population. That has been true since its inception. Um, and uh, it therefore has quite a lot of knowledge to lend to other states that are interested in subjugating their subject populations as well. So let me say a word about Palestine and the Palestinians. Uh, this has changed, it started to change in recent years and it continues to change, which is a good thing, but um, conventionally in the United States for a long time, the conversation when it comes to questions of Palestine and Israel the, the typical things to say, oh, it's too complicated. You throw your hands up, it can't be understood. This has been going on for thousands of years, um, et cetera, et cetera. And of course the issue is complicated, but it's also, like so many issues, profoundly uncomplicated, profoundly simple. The Israeli project involves building a state where there was already a group of people there. And, um, that's not all. It's not just any state. It has to be a Jewish state, which is only relevant to the Palestinians. The only reason why the Jewish character of the Jewish state is relevant to the Palestinians is that the vast majority of them are not Jewish and therefore have no place in this state. Um, it is necessary if there is to be a Jewish state for at least the majority and many supporters of Israel think the entirety of the population to be considered Jewish. And so to have another quite sizable non-Jewish population already present on the land where this state is being built is deeply inconvenient. So inconvenient, in fact, that from the very beginning um, and right through to this day, Israel has worked to really eliminate the Palestinian presence from that place. Now, um, there's a history before 1948, but I want to say a word about that year because it really marked a turning point in the Israeli project. 1948 um, was when Israel fought what it, what it calls the War of Independence. And um, while there had been a Jewish Arab presence in Palestine for centuries prior, by the 1940s, the overwhelming majority of people uh, of, of Israelis, kind of newly declared Israelis who fought this war, were actually um, settlers from, uh, from Europe, newly arrived. A group of settlers declaring a new state, not surprisingly, provoked a response, <laughs> as it would anywhere um, in the world, from other states in the region. And so neighbor, neighboring Arab states sent troops. Now, this is the story, if one hears at all about uh, the, the 1948 war, this is the story that, that one hears, that this is a struggle between a newly declared Israel and uh, invading Arab armies. And of course, that was uh, a, a big feature. But I would argue that the central feature of um, 1948 was actually a war of terror against the Palestinian population, the civilian Palestinian population. And it involved massacres of civilians and, and mass rape, among other uh, forms of violence. Through these means, 800,000 Palestinians fled what would become Israel. Many, um, as they fled, carried their house keys with them, believing that this would be a kind of temporary situation and that they would be able to return to their homes. 
The next year will mark 70 years since 1948, and these house keys have been passed down from generation to generation. And actually, the key has become the symbol of the Palestinian right to and longing for return to Palestine. Therefore, what is known um, by Israelis as the Israeli War of Independence is known by Palestinians as al-Nakba, uh, which means the catastrophe in Arabic. And that catastrophe never stopped. This summer was, for example, the 50th anniversary of the 1967 war, in which Israel occupied East Jerusalem, Gaza, and the West Bank, places that many Palestinians who were displaced in, in 1948 fled to. Now, I won't go into this in detail, but it must also be said, if, in, if I'm mentioning the war of 1967, in, adis, in addition to conquering more Palestinian territory, Israel also seized um, part of southern Lebanon, part of Syria, known as the Golan Heights, and actually a huge section of Egypt, known as the Sinai Peninsula. The result of this violence is now three parts of the Palestinian population. One is uh, the group of Palestinians that, um, to the extent that we hear about Palestinians at all in this country, uh, are the ones that we hear about who live in the West Bank and in Gaza, occupied territories. Uh, there are those Palestinians who live within the borders of Israel, uh, people who are um, uh, often called the 48 Palestinians, the, the, those who've been there since you know, Israel's, the state of Israel's creation in 1948. And they represent um, about 20% of, of the Israeli population, actually. It's quite larger, for example, than the African-American population in this country. And then there is the refugee population in the surrounding countries and actually all around the world, which numbers in the millions. Israel has not only worked to displace Palestinians physically, but also rhetorically. Um, maybe most infamously, um, in 1969, when the Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, said, there were no such thing as Palestinians. They did not exist. Um, and so the very existence, not just it's not only that violence has been used to kind of push Palestinians away from the land, and you know, of course kill many Palestinians, but there's been a denial of the very existence of a Palestinian nation. But Palestinians have refused to be forgotten. And it is really only through their resistance, only through their refusal to surrender, that we know at all about Palestine and Palestinians. This refusal, refusal to simply give up, um, has earned Palestinians demonization. Um, that they are considered the aggressors, they are called terrorists and so on, particularly in the United States. Now, anyone who is taking an honest look at this situation must find this quite strange for this group of people who has been displaced, who's been subject to so much violence, for them to be cast as the aggressors, them to be uh, demonized must be uh, so, so strange. And so, and, and yet that script is repeated. Now, I wanna talk about one moment when that script was repeated um, because it was a really interesting moment. It's the summer of 2014. Now, it was in many ways a nightmarish summer. It was at that time Israel's latest attack on Gaza, really a one-sided one -sided slaughter um, uh, where um, not only were over a thousand Palestinians killed, but that attack in particular for me and for many people around the world will be remembered as a summer of slaughtered children. Over 500 Palestinian children in Gaza uh, were killed in that attack. Um, and yet, again, Palestinians were cast as the terrorists, Palestinians were cast as the aggressors, and so on. Um, a, a kind of caricature that I think is becoming increasingly difficult to defend for Israel. That was one thing that happened that summer. Another thing that happened that summer was the uprising in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and there was a moment when those two things were actually happening at the same time, when Palestinians in Gaza were kind of resisting and enduring this nightmarish attack, at the same time as black people in the suburbs of St. Louis were rising up and calling attention to the police murder of a young man, a black man um, named Michael Brown. Now, when that happened, one of the really um, remarkable things that, that took place during the Ferguson uprising was that immediately 
Palestinians in Palestine took to Twitter and started offering advice to the rebels of Ferguson, saying, here's how you deal with tear gas. We've, we've got experience with it. Um, and then actually there was not one but two statements from Palestinian organizations in Palestine that offered their solidarity with the uprising in Ferguson and offered their solidarity with the black population in the United States. In doing that, what Palestinians were doing was really revisiting what is actually a long and rich history of solidarity between the black struggle in this country and the Palestinian struggle in Palestine. Now, um, with that, let me say a word about the black population here in the US. Um, there are so many weird things happening right now in this country uh, with our current president. Um, was yesterday a full year since election day? Yeah. Mm. Wild what has <laughs> transpired since then. Um, uh, I feel like it's been a year of revelation. For the most part, revelation of the truth, but also revelation of what some people think about the reality of this country and the history of this country. And so um, I want to say something about, um, folks may remember, was it just last week, the White House Chief of Staff, John Kelly, made the latest of several bizarre statements about the US Civil War, in which he said that the Civil War was not, not first of all, he praised Confederate officers as being good people and patriots, which aside from um, the obvious insult to black people who these Confederate officers were fighting to enslave, it's a little strange to declare as patriots the people who were literally waging a war against the country. Um, whatever. <laughs> he also said that the Civil War itself was born out of a failure of compromise, um, which is, uh, <laughs> which is a, a, a strange statement um, to make. Um, for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is that if you know anything about the federal history of the United States, you know that the entirety of that history up to the Civil War was compromise. There was something called the Three-Fifths Compromise, which is written into the Constitution. It legally codifies black people as less than human, as three-fifths human. Uh, there's something called the Missouri Compromise, which was one of many historical examples of what would happen every time in this country that was not only founded on the enslavement of black people, but also founded on the ethnic cleansing um, and genocide directed toward the indigenous population here. This country was expanding state by state and every time they wanted to add a new state seized by the indigenous people here, it provoked a crisis in Washington because the question was, will this be a slave state? or a free state. And so the Missouri Compromise was one of many compromises where they said, we'll have to balance it. We'll have a slave state, and we'll get Missouri, and we'll get the state of Maine also. Um, the location of Washington, D.C. itself was a compromise. Will the capital be in the north, or will it be in the south? Well, it'll be kind of in the middle, but sort of toward the south, which is a nod to the southern slaveocracy. So that was the whole history of, of the, the people who ran this country prior to the Civil War was compromised, and not not compromise like, I like stars and you like stripes, let's put both on the flag. Like, <laughs> compromise on the question of black people's lives, right? Um, and it, the kind of place that the enslavement of black people had at the foundation of the country produced a place that racism has at the heart of the country. And I would argue that it shaped every single political, economic, and social institution of this country. You know, US, the US is, um, has a very uh, funny relationship with its history um, because uh, I don't know if you all have had this experience. I've certainly had the experience of talking about questions of racism today. And then you bring up slavery and say, oh, that was a million years ago. That was so long ago. It's especially strange now that I live in Boston, which is a city whose kind of brand is American history. So you can go to 
like the harbor and there's like this boat, the, the Boston Tea Party boat. You can pay $40 to pretend to be part of the protest and like throw fake tea into the harbor. You know, you, you can participate in this great moment in American history, but slavery, that was a million years ago. So it has a very selective relationship with what history is worth revisiting um, and embracing and what history is worth forgot, forgetting. Um, though, interestingly, since Trump has become the president, there is, it's not a question of forgetting the history of the Confederacy. It's an embrace of the history of the, of the Confederacy. That's another story. Okay. Um, so I think that not only has racism shaped, um, in, 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 in racism in general, but anti-black racism in particular has shaped this country's education system, has shaped its criminal justice, has defined its criminal justice system, um, and countless other institutions, every institution, uh, really, that grew up in this country. So, with that, I want to circle back to the question of black Palestine solidarity um, and talk about its significance. Um, you know, when I was, uh, when I was, um, first getting active around Palestine. And I should say that I, I did, you know, become pretty radical. <laughs> but learning about Palestine was actually the spark for me that, um, that sparked my radicalization. And uh, at the time, um, well, um, some of you may have also had this experience, um, uh, taking a stand for Palestine in this country, I found out was not cool um, <laughs> at, at the time. Um, I mean, it was always cool, but now it, people know it's cool, you know, but, but it, it, was, it, was a, it was a different, it was a different situation. Um, and one of the things that was often said by supporters of Israel and by Israeli politicians themselves was, you know, the Palestinians are so violent, we don't have anybody to negotiate with. If only there was some kind of nonviolent alternative that the Palestinians put forward that we could actually dialogue with, well, then things, we could, we could just resolve this. Now, there's a lot of problems with that, that argument. But for what it's worth, a global, nonviolent kind of entity or, or strategy has emerged, and that's known as the campaign to boycott, divest from, and sanction Israel, BDS. Um, and BDS has been so, has been part of really a sea change uh, uh, on the question of the politics of Palestine in this country and all around the world. And far from embracing the opportunity to uh, supposedly dialogue with BDS activists, Israel has actually convened conferences about what are we going to do to stop BDS because BDS is now the greatest threat to Israel. That's how it's portrayed. Okay, so BDS is a threat so-called, and um, uh, I, I have to say, since we're at a university, um, there is actually a particular effort to prevent BDS um, from being pursued on college campuses around this country, particularly as it becomes more popular. I believe in New York State, there's actually legislation that's been passed that criminalizes boycott, divestment, and sanctions. There are, um, or this is really I think one of the remarkable organizations of our time called Students for Justice in Palestine, which is a nationwide network of, um, uh, of, of students organizing solidarity with Palestine in, in, in this country. And chapters have been um, decertified. Uh, we've had to fight uh, campaigns to get uh, chapters of, of SJP on campus and so on. Okay. So that's the attack on BDS in general. There is also a particular fear among Zionist um, institutions around black Palestine solidarity in particular. There have been extra efforts uh, to cultivate relationships with black clergy in the United States to bring them to Israel. There have been um, extra efforts to bring black college students to Israel um, and to kind of shore up Zionism among the black population. So why? Why are they so afraid of this form of solidarity in particular? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. One, I'll just say, is that Black Palestine solidarity, it shifts the conversation um, a, a, about Israel because it's, it's conventionally kind of cast as this struggle between Jews and Muslims. There's a lot of problems with that characterization. One of many being that 
not all Palestinians uh, are, are Muslim, um, being that the relationships between Jews and Muslims in the Middle East and elsewhere well predate the existence of the state of Israel and have, have looked all kinds of ways and so on. So there's a lot of problems with that. But I think that the big problem that um, you know, the powerful have with black Palestine solidarity is that both the question of the Palestinian population of Palestinian oppression and Palestinian resistance and the question of the black population, particularly in the United States, our oppression and our history of resistance actually get right to the heart of what is wrong with this country and actually with powerful institutions globally. That is exactly why I had the experience of upon learning about Palestine, it was like the special thread that once pulled so much unraveled. And I know that is also true for people. There are people who are not black who paid attention to the history of what has happened to black people in this country and of black resistance in this country. And it reveals the whole nature of the society. Um, to you. And if there's any question about that, let's just look at what is happening with the protest that Colin Kaepernick launched in the, the NFL. First of all, who knew that the National Football League would become the key site of anti-racist struggle in this country, which is quite inspiring, I think. But the other thing is that this is a protest to call attention to police murder of black people and it earns condemnation by the president of the country. He has something to say about what a football player is saying about police murder. That is because it is much bigger than what Colin Kaepernick is saying about police murder. It gets at the heart of what the whole American project is about. Similarly, look at what happened in Ferguson and not just what happened in Ferguson, but what was revealed to people in this country because of the Ferguson uprising. I mean, there are many people, particularly people in my life who are not black, who looked at what was happening. And again, you think this, 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 this kind of casting of the Palestinians as the aggressors, when they are subject to tremendous violence, is something that happens to black people in this country as well. And so, if you're watching the Ferguson uprising unfold on television, and you're watching people who are gathered in a nonviolent gathering not only to call attention to this injustice, but to call attention to an injustice that happened to somebody who they knew. I mean, for me, Mike Brown, I mean, I'm, I'm moved by Mike Brown, but I didn't know Mike Brown. Ferguson is a small community. These were his family and his friends and his classmates who came out to mobilize in a nonviolent fashion. And they were responded to with the Ferguson police, the St. Louis police, the state police, and ultimately the National Guard. And if you're watching CNN and you hear the governor and other politicians say, we have to stop the violence in Ferguson, and they're referring to the protesters, and you see it's actually heavily armed police facing off the protesters, it's got to raise some questions. And it has raised some questions, I think, about the whole nature of this country for many people. Okay, so that is why I think they work so hard to particularly undermine black Palestine solidarity and why it is so potent. I want to say, though, that, that um, I think that all solidarity is like this, but, but for, for, for me, the question of black Palestine solidarity, it doesn't stop there. It's actually an entry point into solidarity more broadly. And actually, the question of Palestine, I think, is, is a central question for so many things happening in the world today. We have an enormous refugee crisis at the, at the moment. First of all, what's going on with migration in the world at the moment is quite wild. I mean, there's a billion migrants in the world at the moment. One in seven people on the planet is a migrant. And um, in response to, and, and that, that crisis, it's discussed too little, is related to other crises. Actually, the migration, people are moving. That, that's an expression of what is happening in terms of climate change. It's an expression of what's happening in terms of wars, etc. In response to these people on the move, in their millions, states all around the world have erected walls, built fences, 
and have done what they can to try to restrict migration. And those states have a pioneer. They have an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Israel says, if you want to know how to deal with a refugee population, we have learned a lot and we can share it with you, which is precisely why when Trump talks about building a wall on the US-Mexico border, he points to the example of Israel, right? So it's an entry point for solidarity on any number of questions. That's just one. Um, and uh, I, I think the question of solidarity in general, but the idea is that all people who are oppressed by this system, which are the majority of people in one way or another, have to find solidarity with each other if we're going to actually get beyond it. So I want to start to conclude and get into the discussion. Um, and say a word about um, say a word about something that we don't get to talk about enough, which is liberation, which is ending oppression. And what would it actually take um, to achieve? Uh, we could talk about liberation in general of all oppressed people, which is what I'm for. I hope that you agree. But let's talk about Palestinian liberation and Black liberation in particular. If Palestinian liberation is going to happen, it cannot take place in the Israeli state as it is currently constituted. It simply can't. That political situation must be entirely restructured. It doesn't mean that Israelis have to leave. In fact, the demand um, at the center of the campaign for BDS, and really that's been at the heart of the Palestinian movement, has been for one state with democratic rights for everybody. Um, so, but that would require a revolutionary restructuring of, uh, of that place. Similarly, I would argue that black liberation cannot take place in the United States as it is currently constituted. Right. Black oppression is so central to American capitalism. So to be concrete, it is not possible, in my opinion, to have a criminal justice system in this country that is not racist. It must be ended. Prison should be abolished. Right. Okay. Um, you're still here after I said that. <laughs> um, so uh, that's that. I think is 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 one of the the points. And, and another point, um, just in terms of the kind of road to that kind of restructuring, that kind of revolutionary um, uh, restructuring, really. It has to be paved with solidarity. And you know, I, I opened with an example of. I don't want to call it solidarity because that's our word, but unity between uh, police forces in the United States and with police forces in Israel. Right. Um, and I'll just say our enemies cooperate all the time. If they can cooperate, we've got to find common ground and solidarity with each other. I want to say, too, that I think the prospect of this kind of um, really necessary transformation happening um, uh, in our lifetimes and, and, and with our generation, um, I'm quite hopeful about. One of the, there's so, so much, again, there's so much happening in the United States um, at the moment. One of the things that I think is not talked about enough and it's not always visible is that there is a shift among young people politically and frankly an excitement and an embrace among young people about socialism you know for, for, a, for a generation of people generations of people who knew little to nothing of the cold war but know a lot about capitalism um, and are interested in an alternative so um, uh, that I think is very hopeful it's something that I think started a few years ago I think Black Lives Matter made a, a tremendous contribution to it and I think Bernie Sanders made a contribution um, as well and what a lot of young people are saying is okay just because Sanders didn't win the Democratic nomination doesn't mean we're ready to go back um, to to politics as usual that that radicalization really continues so that's very good and I think it's actually part of something um, global and with that I want to end on two stories um, one story, um, I, I recently had a, a, a great opportunity to travel to Greece to, um, to give a couple of talks there. And um, I got to speak at this anti-racist, anti-fascist festival in Athens, and I got to speak at a meeting in Thessaloniki. But the most moving part of my experience was actually in a small city called Palmyra, which is um, a small industrial city 
And, um, well, Ptolemaida produces the majority of Greece's electricity. And driving into it, you could see the smokestacks and the power plants. And I'll be honest, I felt like I was back in Rochester. Um, because there were people who were wonderful and uh, thoughtful and people who, who I connected with, who, who were very familiar. Um, and it's a city where people know what it means to be neglected, to be abandoned. Um, and Greece, not just Talmida, but the whole country of Greece, particularly its working class, has been through a lot in recent years. Um, the level of austerity there is, is remarkable. I, I, I talk to people whose wages are one third of what they were just five years ago. Um, so people have experienced tremendous suffering. Hospitals are being closed. Schools are being closed. And, um, and they've, they've, got, uh, they've had a fascist movement actually uh, trying to organize. And so I was very interested in learning um, from folks in Greece about how to resist in this context. And they hear more about the kind of political terrain that they were dealing with. But these people who I met with in Talmida, who were young people, who were teenagers, and they were you know, socialist young people, didn't want to talk about Greece. They wanted to talk about the United States. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, mm -hmm. is it true that the police kill black children in the US? Is it true that when they do it, they get away with it? They couldn't believe it. I mean, just a few years back, the police murdered a 15-year-old activist in Athens. The country exploded in protest because it's unheard of for the police to kill somebody, let alone a child. But in that conversation, as I was talking to them, you know, five names of black children came to mind immediately. Police have murdered, and, 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 and murdered with impunity. Now, those people have never been to the United States, but they know all they need to know about the United States, which is that it's a country where the police murder black children. That says a lot about a society. And while the conditions of austerity that they are facing and neglect that they are dealing with in Talmida is no doubt part of shaping their radical worldview, the oppression of black people here and our resistance here is also shaping their worldview. It is part of this global radicalization. And so we have to do uh, what we can here um, to continue to wage uh, a, a, a battle, and I think we've, there, there are two, two targets um, on this question. One, the people who run this country, we've seen, are, have been unresponsive, really, to Black Lives Matter. I mean, where is the legislation to speak to these police murders? There, there, there is none, right? So they're willing to have police kill us, uh, and they're willing to have courts uh, let them get away with it. There are also, so that, that, is, that is, I think, our primary target, but it is also the case that there are people who live in this country who are not powerful people who accept that kind of racism. And you see it. I remember when Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old boy in Cleveland, was murdered. I remember reading the comments. You know, I know you're not supposed to do that. Read the comments on the news sites of the Cleveland media now, if you're willing to accept the police murder of a child, then you're willing to accept a lot. Mm -hmm. Not only, I would argue, in terms of what happens to other people, but in terms of the oppression that you experience. Right. I think that you're less likely to fight for yourself if you allow this kind of violence to take place against children. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and, and it, is, it is the case that the number of white people killed by police in this country far exceeds that in other countries around the world. The number of white people incarcerated, even though it's obviously obvious to everybody in this room, disproportionately racist, the number of white people locked up in this country well exceeds the number of people locked up in other countries. That's racism. So we want to win people 
to black liberation for the sake of black liberation, but also as part of their own liberation. That's one thing. The second thing, and I'll, I'll end on this, um, uh, it's a little story from earlier this year. It's been such a, again, bizarre year. Um, and uh, one of the, well, one of the remarkable things is, is that the year really opened, January opened with mass protests. The Women's March, well overdue. I'm so excited and proud that what is being called the largest day of protest in US history was a protest for women. This is very important. Um, the incredible protests at the airports in solidarity with Muslims against the Muslim ban and so on. And I think that so much of what has been done, what the Trump administration has done since then has been to try to get us to forget that very recent and powerful experience. But the fact is that millions of people in this country went to their first protest this year. Okay, I want to tell you about one, um, one protest. In, um, in Boston, where I live, um, we had a protest in solidarity with the Muslim community uh, in a place called Copley Square. That's only, the, the, the name of the place, the location is only significant because Copley Square happens to be where the finish line of the Boston Marathon is. And just a few years prior, there was a terror attack there. And on that Sunday, 30,000 people filled Copley Square in solidarity with Muslims. Remarkable thing in a city where there had been a terror attack um, in, in, in the, same, uh, the same location, followed by a wave of Islamophobic violence. So that day was incredible for so many reasons. Um, the, the crowd was so big that the sound system couldn't possibly uh, transmit to everybody. We couldn't even hear the sound stage. And so, um, you know, I was there with some comrades and I had a, uh, a megaphone and we had a banner and we were kind of like looking around, okay, it'd be cool if we, we started to kind of talk on the megaphone. And so people started chanting. And, you know, we were trying to get something started, but we, were, we weren't really sure what we were doing. And um, uh, this, this group of Somali high school students um, ran up to, the, to, to us and this woman took the megaphone and said, give me that. And, and she, she showed us how to use it. She got on the megaphone and she started speaking. And, um, you know, it was her first time actually speaking on a megaphone. And a crowd was gathered and she said, I'm black, I'm Muslim, and I'm a woman. I'm targeted more than once by Donald Trump. And the crowd went wild. And that person is not only a remarkable person, but I think somebody who is living in a remarkable time, because there is a conversation happening, particularly among young people, this thing called intersectionality, that sees different forms of oppression as intersecting and producing something uh, uh, qualitatively powerful in terms of oppressing people. But if you understand it, it can be uh, liberating. She was articulating that. She said, this is our country. And then she paused and she said, well, not our country. Because she also remembered Standing Rock, which it happened the year before. One of the most remarkable struggles, I think, of our time. Um, and that statement was in solidarity with indigenous people. And she ended her speech by saying, you know, I'm just so happy to see you all and to know that you've got my back. Have you got my back? And we all chanted, we've got your back. And I looked around and many of the people gathered, well, most of the people were white. You know, many from Boston, many from the suburbs. Now, I don't know if they knew that they would find themselves chanting, I've got your back with this young black Muslim Somali woman, but that's what they did. That's remarkable in of itself, but I noticed in the crowd this guy, tall white guy, and he had on a hat that said, Afghanistan veteran. And I went up to him and I said, um, hey man, are you a vet? And he said, yeah. I said, well, I'm glad to see you here. I'm just curious what, what brought you here? And he said, you know, um, I fought in Afghanistan and uh, when I see what's happening in this country, this isn't what I fought for. And so since coming back, I've been trying to get involved with helping out refugees. And I found out about this rally and I came. So Trump's tweets are happening. There's something else happening beneath the surface, not always <laughs> visible. And I think that those of us who see it and want to see it have to nurture it and build on it 
um, and really build a process of struggle and solidarity. And that's not always an easy process, but it's the process that we have to commit to because a future of liberation depends on it. Thank you. Thank you.